All right, going live on video. Stand by for audio. All right, good day and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another Live the Fuel show. So today I am bringing on, yes, yet another brand new co-host for you, another guest mindset to mind meld with me and obviously you guys, the listeners. And today, this gentleman's dialing in. We're actually recording nice and early in the morning because that's how we hustle. And he hustles so much that he owns a brand titled Rapid Growth. Actually, specifically, he's the Rapid Growth guy. And he's got a few other things out there like, oh, maybe the introvert's edge. Any of you listening might be an introvert. You might want to tune into this episode. So long story short, this guy has got challenging personal professional obstacles that has changed his life throughout his career. Uh, I followed him on LinkedIn and everywhere else, and uh, he gets around. He's on TV. He's he's a speaker. He's a business coach. Uh, he does a lot. He does a lot. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Matthew Pollard, sir. Mate, honored to be here, bud. Thanks for having me on. By the way, I didn't get to say before we started recording, I do love the accent. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's not just for the ladies. I think us guys, you do appreciate the fact that, at least here in the U.S., I don't have that very exciting of an accent. <laughs> Well, you know, they, they say the English accent is probably the most respected accent on the, uh, on the planet, which I think is crazy. But the Australian accent comes pretty close to the top in the top five, which is ridiculous because we're a bunch of convicts over there in Australia, right? And I love the history behind that. I do. I do. <laughs> well, have you heard that the Australian accent is actually derived from drunken English because convicts had this, this thing where obviously they drunk a little bit more. So the accent is actually derived from, from drunken English. So I, I think it's a great- That I didn't realize. Because <laughs> I've had a few Aussies on this show. Um, so no one has ever brought that up, ever. <laughs> well, we were, talking, we were talking beforehand, and I haven't fact-checked this, but we were talking beforehand about my good friend, Judy Robinette, who wrote yeah. my book. And she was the one that actually told me. She was, um, she's like, you know, Matt, I've always appreciated your accent, but I have to tell you something I read the other day. And I'm like, well, that's great because I can bring myself down a peg when people say, I love your accent. Now I can say, well, actually, the accent you shouldn't be respected. It's just drunk in English. It's okay. It's not that big a deal. Exactly right. <laughs> I'm going to bring that. I'm going to message that later on to, uh, have you ever heard of, uh, I, I wear a blue blocker sunglasses at night. Well, not sunglasses, but blue blocker glasses. And I got like three different brands here because I've had different founders on the show. But have you ever heard of Swanee's? Uh, the, the Swanick Sleep Company. That's I the, haven't. Are they based out of South, um, South Australia? Well, he's he's from Aussie. He's from Australia, but I believe now he's residing in California. Okay. Uh, but his whole brand is Swanick Sleep, and he's got these not re really high-end stylish glasses. Not all these blue blockers have nice stylish glasses, but then again, as I say, blue blocking glasses. There's people out there who still, especially if you're new to this show, have no idea what a blue blocker glasses are. <laughs> so. But well, I mean, I highly recommend. Myself. Yeah, have you ever worn a pair? I have not. See, all right. Well, if you're ever in front of your computer screens, or anything else later in the evening, highly recommend it. You want to block those frequencies out. They actually impact uh, your body's ability to flip into that deep sleep capability. So when people are watching their iPads and very very high end TVs and iPhones and doing any computer work in the evening, and they wonder why they're deep sleep is not as effective this is a trigger point on that so yeah. very cool it's not me it's all the scientists i get to talk to it's great so <laughs> I, get, I get to geek out on health so i mean i obviously today you're a huge business buff right so quick side note on that Are, do, you, do you geek out a little bit on the health or do i geek out on health i yeah. do i do i mean i go i go through stages when it comes to health so when i go through a launch i'd, I'd like to say that because of the fact that i geek out on health during certain periods when i get to that period of time i have the energy and the resilience to be able to get through a really tough launch so okay. my for instance my book launched in january and i still you know i still do things like orange theory or something like that so i can keep mm. my you know um, to keep my uh, stamina up but you know I, I can't do as much as i would like because i'm traveling i'm on the road all the time the way you can be mindful Let's face it, you can go to the healthiest restaurant in the world, they still put stuff in it to make sure that you come back, right? So yeah. I would like to say that I focus on more on my health during my non-launch periods, um, but I feel that that actually allows me to be calm, be resilient, have huge amounts of explosive energy during the times where I actually need it. And I think anyone that doesn't do that, that when the times aren't tough, they just can't get through those tough times. So no, I'm a big supporter of that in my 
fiance makes sure that I eat absolutely clean when I'm when I'm in town. She's she's huge on health and making sure that I eat right. See, your fiance and I would get along because I have to do that for my fiance. <laughs> so there's a little flip of the role there, but uh, I, I I reinforce everything you're saying. I mean, especially nowadays, I think if you took everything out of what you just said there, I think the key word there was energy. Um, especially someone like yourself, man. Like again, you're a speaker, you're a coach, you're a consultant. And then, oh, let's go ahead and write a book while we're at it because I just have nothing else better to do. <laughs> All of that's going to take energy. Actually, while we're talking about your book, let's go ahead and do a little screen sharing for our video feed because, again, to our listeners, check him out at his name, okay, MatthewPollard.com. But obviously, you originally had booked this show back in February, your assistant, but you guys had a lot going on. We rescheduled for now. So the introvert's edge is out and available, right? That's right. Yeah. So it's, um, it's been available since January. Uh, we've moved about four or four and a half thousand copies so far um, of the print version, but the audio book is, is really outselling the, the print version hands down. I think about four to one copies. So well, I got. I'm, 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 I'm an audio guy myself. I mean, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader in late high school, so I'm a listening guy more than anything. Um, so yeah, I'm ecstatic. I mean, it's been endorsed by Neil Patel, uh, Marshall Goldsmith, Harvard, Princeton. It's just a whole different way of selling and, you know, the whole focus is around teaching introverts how they can be authentically themselves. So, you know, it really changes the game for introverts that kind of feel that they just don't have the gift of the gab, so they can't do this miraculous thing called selling. So you'll appreciate this. I have a lot of people that have known me only in the past 10 years. So I'm 40 now, as of 2018. And uh, by the way, I'm healthier and fitter than ever because I know how to take care of myself. So anyway, but the funny thing is, I wasn't always a podcaster, right? I wasn't getting into speaking years ago, but I, I was in, I had moved my way up in a company, got into management, was coaching and developing people within a, within a company. And I think a lot of that probably helped bring me out of my own shell. And I tell people that, and they're like, what do you mean your shell? And it's like, oh, I was very introverted as a kid. And they're like, there's no way. You, ex you, you, you exude type A personality. Like, cause I, I do CrossFit competitions and everything else. Like I, I put myself out there. And people are like, there's no way you were a type B or might be a little introverted. I was like, I was, I remember being a shy kid. I wasn't as outgoing as I am today. I did have a lot of energy and then eventually I channeled that and found a way to, I guess, talk to more people and get myself out there. So I'm just intrigued for your perspective on that since you got a whole book about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, introversion, extroversion, there are a thousand studies out about what exactly it is and then you've got this whole new term called ambiversion and then oh maybe i'm a learned extrovert there's just there's there's too much out there to make it so confusing that you don't even know what how to classify yourself so how do you know what help to work on and i'm i'm a big fan on on learning and considering anything that i have a gap in a skills gap and wanting to fill that gap but for me i feel like the easiest thing for people to do to understand what they are is to ask themselves where they draw their energy See, I'll give you an example. So we talked about a small business festival. Um, it's a conference that I run in, in Austin, Texas, but it's now a national conference. We ran- well, Oh, over, I didn't know it was national now. Yeah, we ran over 100 events across the country uh, during National Small Business Week uh, this year. So it's, wow. it's a big event. We had uh, just, just over 300 speakers this year and we win government proclamations. They're all free events for the community to enjoy. So it's a great, uh, it's a great event and we, we work with local organizing parties to do it. But in Austin, we ran premium stage and uh, Jim Cathcart, great friend of mine, number one most award-winning speaker in the world, he and I were speaking on stage and in and around the environment for the entire three-day period of that, that premium conference. The difference was at the end of those three days, he was excited, pumped up, and wanted to go down Rainy Street, which for people that don't know Austin very well, it's called the live music capital of the world. And that, you know, Rainy Street and Sixth Street are really the, the reason for why it got that name. So he wants to go out because he's energized from spending time with all these people for three days. I wanted to go into a dark room, switch on a TV, talk to no one, get to get those blocker glasses, put them on, and absolutely zone out. That nice. is the difference. So when people say, oh, there's no way you could be you know, a you know, type B, C personality type because you're out there doing all of these things. I mean, I'm speaking on some of the biggest stages in the world. I mean, I know that uh, coming up, I'm speaking on a stage in front of about 14,000 people. I've got a couple of other stages in front of hundreds and hundreds of people coming up just the next two months. Mm -hmm. I know that I'm coaching clients. I know I've got podcast interviews. I, 
also know that at the end of each one of those, I'm going to need time to myself to regenerate and focus on my own internal en energy. Now that means that, you know, I could be spending some time writing. It could be some time on my email. It could be time sitting in front of the TV because I'm just completely exhausted after doing one of those activities. That's really the difference between an introvert and an extrovert. Now you can frame it however you want. What you've learned is skill sets. And that's, that's what I've learned as well. So the natural introvert would be adverse to speaking, to networking, to doing podcast interviews, to putting themselves out there. However, an introvert that sees it for what introversion actually is, which is a skills gap, just like anything else, will know that they just have to learn the skill sets to achieve those things. So for me, I learned, and that's what the book's about, I learned the strategies and the system of a sale so that it's a natural step-by-step -step process that naturally leads to a sale, no hard closing, no bulldog techniques, because as an introvert, we need to stay close to our point of authenticity and congruence. We don't like those techniques, and there's no need to have those. With, but then there's also you know, things like networking. Ivan Meisner, the founder of BNI, largest networking group in the world, I interviewed him on my podcast, The Introvert's Edge, and he's, he's, he found out only a few years ago he was an introvert. It's a funny story, actually, but he found out he was an introvert in a fight with his wife, and afterwards, when oh, he's written a blog post called, oh my God, I'm an introvert. Listeners should definitely check that out. It's, it's, a, it's a fun story. Uh, but, you know, he learned the strategies for networking. You know, Jamie Masters, number three podcaster in, America, in the world for entrepreneurs. You know, she used to get this massive rash across the side of her face because when she was interviewing people or speaking on stage. Now, I think she's one of the most amazing presenters and definitely one of the best interviewers I've ever seen. Again, another introvert. And then you go completely the other side of the scale and you look at people like Zig Ziglar, probably one of the biggest stage presenters, sales trainers in the world, introvert as well. Now, if you talk to his son, Tom Ziglar, then he'll tell you that his dad used to go home afterwards, collapse, and just spend time what, you know, being with his family and just having his own time. He was exhausted. Absolutely, absolutely exhausted. And I think that's the important thing for people to learn. Introverts and extroverts, can both achieve amazing things. We both have our burdens to bear. For an extrovert, they're perhaps not as good at listening or they're perhaps not as good at empathy as the introverts come naturally. They can learn those skills, but it doesn't come as naturally that it does to introverts. Introverts need to learn the strategies for all of these, what you would consider A-type personality activities. But then once we've learned these strategies, a lot of times, because we're focused on a system, not a natural ability, we can actually beat the extroverts hands down at that, which is why you might be outperforming a lot of your, your extroverted A-type natural comparisons because you've learned the strategies you've had to build up to it, and that's why you excel. Oh, I, I, I'm loving everything you're saying right now because countless episodes of the show, but we've, we've brought up the power of putting in the reps, specifically around personal development and professional development. And everything you just said just reinforces all of that is that a, a newer term or statement I've been using in the past probably few months just started coming out and uh, through the power of podcasting was it's like, you know what, we're just at a different place on the timeline, right? You're at a different, you're a little bit further on <laughs> than myself when it comes to my speaking career. But the whole point is you just put in the reps a little bit sooner and took action a little bit sooner and started building up that, that repertoire. So I love what you're reinforcing right now because that's what we're talking about is you don't know how to know everything yet, but you need to see, at least start taking some action, starting some development, developing the skills to figure out, oh, actually, now that I've been spending time on that skill, I don't really like that skill, but these are the skills that I'm good at. Like I'm a big supporter of, um, I just use this with my client. Have you ever used a Strengths Finder 2.0? Have I ever used what, sir? The book called Strengths Finder 2.0. I haven't heard of it, but no, no, I haven't. Oh, I love it because... You go on the website, and I probably have my library here, but um, oh. the author is Tom Rath. So, <laughs> but long story short, you just, you buy, you have to buy the physical book because you get your own unique code to go on their website. And it's one of those psychological analysis tests. They run you through a series of questions and everything else. But here's the trick. He's got every strength in his book, right? But you don't read the whole book. You finish all this questioning, and then it spits out your top five strengths, things that should naturally be adept to you. And then you read just those chapters. And then you apply those chapters, and in those chapters, they have information assigned to either, if you're in the employee lifestyle, the entrepreneurial lifestyle, health, fitness, heck, even like relationships. But the point is, 
his whole point is everybody's been spending so much time trying to develop their weaknesses. And I think this ties back to what you just said is you need to determine the skills that you are most comfortable with, maybe your natural strengths and develop those and outsource your weaknesses. What do you say to that? So there are a couple of factors there. So I want to be careful to make sure that introverts don't look at the world and go, oh, so I need to outsource sales and marketing and networking. Okay. Oh, yeah. and, and a lot of times that, hap where, that happens when somebody founds a company, you know, that you've got this tech guy that's got this great idea, introverted, doesn't want to speak to people. So he takes on a partner because that person's the A-type personality. And trust me, that person will end up letting you down and you'll end up having to do the selling, but you've lost half the company. So the, the thing that you need to understand as an introvert is you don't move away from skill sets because you feel like you can't do them, because you feel that they're not your strengths. You need to actually test it first. Best example I can give you is, are you a skier? Do you ski? Do I what? Do you ski? Oh, ski? Yeah. Oh yeah, I coached ski racing for 11 years. Brilliant. The first time that you were skiing, were you excellent at it? Uh, <laughs> so truth be told, and uh, I've had my shoulder rebuilt twice, once in 1999 and once in 2007. I didn't learn to ski until I was 18. The day I took my first lesson, I destroyed my shoulder. So Okay, so it kind of sucked for you. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> I remember, well, I remember the first time I got on skis and I finally started to get some momentum and I'm going down this mountain and have this realize that I don't know how to stop. And there is this, I would say nine year old girl in front of me and I don't know how to change direction. I don't you know. Run her over. <laughs> so I have literally yelled out sorry from a mile away, picked her up as I've gone through and then fallen and I couldn't move. I hit I landed on my back and I couldn't move for days. I was in so much pain. Yeah. So a lot of the activities, just because we didn't know how to do them at the start, even though they're painful, even though they kind of suck for us it doesn't mean we can't learn the skill set. And once we've learned the skill set, they can't be fun. Mm -hmm. For instance, you now obviously love to ski and you have a great time doing it. For me, that didn't take. However, <laughs> the, the point that I'm, I'm getting at is that what you really need to understand is just because it didn't work out the first time, it doesn't mean that it's not going to work out long term. Once you've learned the skill set. For me, I do know how to ski now. And while I don't in Japan, particularly enjoy it because what I learned is I'm not a big fan of the snow for you you it didn't work out well for you at the start but now you love it and that's the difference for me selling marketing networking speaking from stage when you know I mean it was 93 doors before my first sale it was terrifying I'll, you know I'll tell you I'll share that story in more detail if you're interested but by the time I got to where I am now or where I was even 10 years ago I really quite enjoy it and now I feel anxious if I don't get to do that every now and then because I, I've created that as almost a reward for myself. You're referring to you get anxious if you don't get a chance to do the sales process? Correct, yeah. yeah. So, Actually, I'm glad you're clarifying that because I'm you and I have vibed very well because I'm also a sales and marketing professional. That's actually most of my career uh, after I left the corporate space and did the coaching and all that. So you can't beat the bulletproofing of life to get yourself into an awkward sales process or awkward sales conversation situation. Like everybody I talk to, and that's why I'm reinforcing what you just said earlier about, you know, don't always outsource your sales and marketing. Every single person in an organization has to know how to quote unquote sell, meaning you need to know who you are as the professional, who your company is as a professional organization or organization or charity. It doesn't matter, right? Everybody should understand how to, quote unquote, pitch what it is they do because everybody in the organization needs to understand what each other do, what they stand for, how they come across to the, to the consumer. And that, that's, that's crucial because yes, in the end, you're going to hire a sales team, maybe outsource that. But in the end, if you as the owner can't at least help somebody understand your company, even if you're not in sales, that's pretty sad. I mean, there, there's something wrong there. So I, I totally am backing up what you're saying. And I think it is important to understand sales because you sell, you sell somebody when you lie to your parents as a kid. 
you know, lying to your parents. You're selling them a fib, okay? When you're in a dating process, you are selling yourself in that dating process. So whether I always tell people, the years I've coached, I said, guys, like, everybody's a sales professional. You just haven't gotten there yet. You just had a different place on the timeline. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, it doesn't matter whether, I mean, one of the biggest things that they teach in these dating programs, the, you know, the mass dating programs for guys that are a little bit shy is the first thing you need to do is go out and ask, go out on the city street, just get 10 phone numbers. Why? Because it's the anxiety that comes with the approach because they feel, I mean, Brian Tracy talks about this in sales, like rejection is akin to feeling spanked as a child right so that psychological connection we need to realize that it actually isn't as painful as we've made out so in dating they teach that i mean when you go for a job interview you're totally selling when you want your boss to approve a new program for what you're currently doing in your job you're selling to them every single thing that you do if you're trying to convince your kids to go to bed at 10 o'clock and they um and they say that they want to stay up you're selling to them the fact that they need to go to bed Right, or, or you're a very aggressive parent, whichever one you want. Yeah, you know, could be one or the other. There. Yeah. So, and you know, there are, there are pros and cons to both, and there are times and places for both. But the thing I'm, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that, yeah, sales is something that really plays a part in every single element of our life. The one thing that I find, and I really don't want to take the, uh, the, the focus off the fact that introverts do need to learn how to sell, because at the end of the day, I mean, yes, you can hire an extroverted founder. Yes, you can go to a networking event like a lot of the networking books say with an extrovert and ask for introductions, but that makes you non-self-sufficient. That makes you reliant on someone else. And when you're in business and you want to do the hard yakka, or well, that's an Australian term, the hard yards, if you like, in America. I was, I was going to need a little help on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hard, yeah. I still, you know, it's funny. Like my author wanted to take out a bunch of the Australianisms out of my book. And I'm like, no, that makes me me. We're leaving me. No, in. thank you. Yes. Keep keep the uniqueness in there. Just explain it maybe a little bit. <laughs> that's that's exactly it. So I come with transcripts just for everybody at home. So if you want to come with transcripts. But the, the thing that, the one thing that I really want people to understand from a business owner level though, is while I, I want you to understand you can sell and there is a step-by-step -step strategy to lead to selling, the thing that you do need to understand is if you don't know how to articulate what you do, first thing is you should never hire salespeople until you can. You've got to have that, you, there, what I consider rapid growth or my rapid growth system, if you like, is three steps. And sales is the last one for a reason because if you don't focus on step one and two, while you can succeed still in sales and you know the the problem you have is that you're making it much more difficult for yourself so what i always talk about is what you've got to create is a unified message that separates you from everybody else pick a niche of customers that are willing to buy and then by the time you get to that then sales really become simple and depending on how much time we've got i can give you an example of that if you'd like Oh, we're rocking out right now. Actually, while you're saying, I'm actually doing a screen share again and show up a little rapid growth section of your site. But uh, <clears throat> I love where you're going with this. That's why we are going to dig deeper in this because, again, just for fun, people listening to keep listening, he's going down a business segment here. But again, this applies back to the real world of relationships too, right? Like everybody just throws out a wide broadcast net and they wonder why they're not dating enough and not with enough. And by the way, I'm not a love doctor at all. I'm just speaking to experience because I put a lot of reps in. And it's like, guys, who do you want to be to the world? What message are you putting out there? Who is your target audience? Who is your niche? So this applies to love. This definitely applies to business where we're going next. Am I right? Absolutely. And it's funny when you talk about dating, one of the biggest things that we do when we're single is we say, well, we're looking for a date. Any, any date will do. Oh, no, no. Maybe we've got some qualities. We want them to look like this. We want them to look like this. We want them to look like this. I don't hear look, look, look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's the only thing we do, right? So the, the thing that's really important for people to know is that, I mean, being focused is probably one of the most important things in life. And actually, even once... You know, once I give you this example, there's a template that I can direct you to. A lot of people will struggle with step three of the template because they haven't really taken the time to think about what they want. I mean, people tend to inherit their goals and you know, what they want from their mother, their father, their I don't know, drunk roommate they had in college. You know, they, <laughs> they hear these goals or they hear in a dating scenario, this is the type of woman that they want to date or man that they want to date. And because of that, they go out and they run for it. And a lot of times... 
they'll struggle to get that motivation to go out and achieve it, or that's maybe why they're not going out to, to meet that dream partner. A lot of times they'll struggle to get that motivation to put in the work. Other times they'll get there and they'll be like, oh my gosh, why did I go and do that to myself? Right? It wasn't, it wasn't worth it. That person sucks. And a lot of times the reason for that is, and I, I think that's a real big problem when it comes to, to goal setting and values. But if you just focus on, on a goal setting perspective, people are really good. I mean, everybody's heard this term smart goals now, right? Right. Make the, the major elements are specific, measurable and time-based. The problem is that you can tell me a goal. I'm like, that sounds awesome. I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to achieve that. Make it specific, make it measurable, make it time-based. I can go out and get it. High achievers are amazing at this. Ask them why they want it. Oh my God, all of a sudden they can't figure out the answer, right? And so for me, I've got this podcast episode on, I've got another podcast called The Better Business Coach, which is kind of where I teach business coaches how to be better at what they do. But what I find is a lot of people go there to coach themselves as well. And the podcast is episode 17. It's called Forget About Goals. Why is the key to success? And it talks about the fact that high achievers will write these goals, go out and achieve them, and it never makes them, it never makes them happy. So hmm. what I think people do is write three business goals, two personal goals, one incredibly selfish to themselves, and then summarize each one of those goals in 250 words or less. The, including why it's important. To Only 250. Okay. Well, that's, the reason, a, that's a good exercise. So each one of the goals, 250 words or less. Now, the specific measurable and time-based element, that can take like one line. The why is what I really want to hear. And the reason for that is if it's a personal goal, the why will actually highlight why it's important. Now, if you look at a lot of, let's call them superficial men, they might say, I want them to be six foot tall, blonde, blue eyes. You know, that's the kind of girl that I want to date. And then they're going to write why. And it's going to be completely external focused. I want my friends to be impressed, right? I, you know, that's the, the whole focus around making sure the why is important for you. When I did this for my personal goal, you know, I articulated exactly the type of thing that I wanted in a woman. Not the things I didn't want, the things I wanted in a woman. And I'm marrying her in September. So the, the thing for me, and when you go to a business goal now, it's here's what I want specifically. Here's why I want it. Now, for a lot of people, they might say, I want to make a million dollars. Why do you want to make a million dollars? Very few people can come up with the specific reasons for why that's necessary to make in the next 12 months because a million dollars doesn't make you happy. But if you're struggling to make $27,000 and you make 75, that's going to make you ecstatic. Focus on that for the time being and why that's important. Now, your wife can maybe start to work with you in the business. Maybe you can, um, you know, actually have an office for yourself. Maybe you can feel like you're contributing, you know, all of those sorts of things. And then what happens is when you get to 75, you might look up and go, what's the next goal? And while I wouldn't suggest it would be a million dollars, but you might have hit that 75,000 in six months where you set a million dollar goal for two years you look up and you're like, what am I willing to trade in for the next part, the next step in my life? And, you know, I did this with a ghostwriter who came to me and said, I want to make a million dollars in the next 12 months. And I said, a million dollars, really? I mean, you've made 27,000 in 2013. It's October, 2014. You've made 12. Yeah. Do you really want to do that? Yeah, and it's, a, it's a good aggressive goal. I mean, it's a, it's a great aggressive goal, but the thing that I set, I, I set out is having an aggressive goal is fantastic, but, you have to, in my mind, build self-efficacy towards that goal first, right? So if you're going to run a marathon that, and you're going to go run, what is it, a 10-kilometer a, a marathon, right? If it's the first time you've ever had to go for a long run, they're not going to suggest going to it. The first thing you should do is enlist for a 10-kilometer marathon, right? Well, it, it, we've talked about this before, too, because I did it completely back back asswards. I did... <laughs> I did a marathon, an actual marathon first, 26.2 miles. I don't know what the kilometers are that. Then years later, started moving backwards. So I was like, oh, I'm going to go try that half marathon and then a 10K and then a 5K. And everybody was like, isn't that supposed to be the other way around? I'm like, I never said I knew what I was doing, but I had to learn from those mistakes. So now I can tell people, please start with a 5K, then 10K, then half marathon, then full marathon. You build up to it. Absolutely. And, and the thing you would have noticed is that when you did 5k, it would have seemed hard for the first kilometer, which is about how hard it is for me when I'm when I run. And then after that, it doesn't seem so hard. And then after you get past 10, 
after you get past 5K, the next 5K doesn't seem so hard. And you can step it up. And this is the thing about, so there are two major transactions that are happening inside your mind. Your mind. So with Derek, I said to him that, listen, you know, at the moment you, you've got self, you've, you've 12,000 in October, you haven't built the self-efficacy you need to be, to be successful. So he set himself a $56,000 goal to hit by the end of the year. Now it's October, he made 12,000 so far. Now through some sales and marketing strategy advice as well, in six weeks, he made $80,000. Okay, so he broke now, his goal. He broke his goal. Now here's the thing, when I told him, how do you wanna make a million dollars at the start? He said, well, I'm a ghostwriter. I wanna have 10 ghostwriters working for me, each one making $200,000 a year. Each one taking half of that as a salary, the other half comes to me, I'm making a million dollars a year. Seems okay. right. Math, the, math works out. Except for the fact that he'd made 12,000 by October and he's the one teaching them. Does it, you see the problem here. The so the model's not replicatable. Exactly right. So now he's made 56,000. I asked him, so I asked him the question, do you still want to have this business model with 10 staff working for you to make a million dollars? His response, oh my gosh, no. If I did that, then I would have to manage all these staff. I'd have to be in their office all the time. I can work from home. I could do my own thing. You know, if I, I really don't want to have 10 staff working for me. Gosh, that would be stressful. I said, well, tell well, me. To pause on this is what you're, what you're hitting on is a key component that we discussed on this show a lot, which is the lifestyle component. Going back to what, what you've already talked about and I've mentioned many, many times is defining your why. It powers everything because if, if to your point, if you're going to say, oh, I want that million dollars, so you focus on the dollar sign, but then you start realizing what, what it takes to get there. Now it comes back into the why. It's like, okay, well, is the why strong enough to justify all those what's? <laughs> and that's where people get a wake-up call. And it's like, wait a minute, do I really need that? I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, this is, but this is the thing, right? I don't, the last thing I want to do is be outwardly spoken that I don't want you to make a million dollars. What I want to be outwardly spoken with is there are steps towards making it and you want to make a million dollars doing what's important to you. Now, I can, I can tell you that, you know, I've learned that you can create rapid growth out of any type of business model, but there is nothing worse than creating rapid growth in a business with customers you can't stand in a business that you don't want to be in. Right. So for Derek, if I helped him get to the 10 staff and the million dollar turnover, for firstly, a million dollar, sorry, a million dollars profit, the but side note, a million dollars turnover can mean you make less money than the secretary that you walk past all the time. Right. It doesn't mean you're making profit. So always have a focus on profit goals. But for Derek, he would, he wanted to make a million dollars doing this for two reasons. One was, he didn't believe he could ever make a million dollars, but it made him feel better to assume that he could achieve his million dollar task doing this thing. And it was the only way he could see himself making a million dollars because that's where his mindset was at. So what we, what we did was by getting him to that 56,000, I then said to him, how do you want to make, uh, how much money do you want to make next? And what do you want to achieve? And he said, well, my next financial goal is 200, uh, sorry, $120,000. And then, he, I said, well, okay, and what do you want to do when you do that? He said, I, once I hit 120,000, my next step is that I really want, I want to have a business in my hometown where I have like a bookshop where people can come. He's a ghostwriter, where people can come, read books, you know, have some, some training, there's some training and seminars in the back. I really want to have an independent bookstore. Now, he got to 120,000, and you know, there's a whole backline story around how he got into there because, you know, he, you know, he made 40,000 in the first two weeks. 80,000 in, in about six weeks. And then by the end of the year, he made 120,000. When I got him to 120,000, I said, do you still want the bookstore? And he said, no, that would be like a boat anchor holding me yeah. down because now, you know, I can, you know, I can fly away with my kids. We can travel. We can do all these things. The last thing I would want to do is do that. Here's the thing. Now, I mean, he's a year later, he made just shy of $300,000. So he's on his way to making that million dollars. But I mean, he'll attest that his happiness improved a little bit, but not a lot after about 75. Yeah. And the rest that he got back is the fact that he's not, it's not the earning of the more money, it's the fact that he's designed his life exactly the way he wants it to be. So a lot of people will put that million dollar goal because we're jumping into a business for ourselves and we're like, a million dollars will prove to everybody else that we did it for a reason. Forget about everybody else. Mm -hmm. 
300,000 for Derek is a lot of money. And now he gets to spend time with his kids, he gets to spend time with his wife, he works from home most of the time. In the last 12 months, he's worked with clients in Switzerland and, in, and London, which took him and his wife to Paris. But he gets to travel all the time with the people that he loves. So think about what you truly want, and that's where the why statements really come into it. I love that. Now, real quick on a side note, was that guy also an introvert? <laughs> Was he one of your followers of that, uh, that type of niche? Yeah, absolutely. So Derek's backstory is that when we first started working together, I actually, and he's actually, if you look at um, my book, Derek's name's actually on the cover. Oh, really? And oh. There's, a, there's a reason for that. I think that's the, the link, yeah. So you'll see Derek Lewis at the bottom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Derek was a ghostwriter. And after I helped him, he's like, dude, we absolutely need to share these strategies with the other introverted audience. And I'm, I'm like, you know what? I've always wanted to have that book written. As a matter of fact, I've been outwardly spoken for years that somebody needed to write a book for introverts to learn how to sell. But I had a reading speed of a sixth grader in late high school. I didn't assume that I was gonna be the one to write it. As a matter of fact, that was the last thing I wanted to do. But eventually I just got fed up that nobody else did. And Derek did make me feel confident that he and I could do it together. So- well, I love it because you're, in, you're just one more of many authors I have on the show that just inspired me to take my own action and finally get around and writing my book. So, because <laughs> well, uh, I, I just, the, the thought of sitting down and making myself write, but then again, I can say that because I don't do it yet. If I put enough reps in, I might find I might enjoy the process. Well, this is the thing though, around what you were saying about learning how to do what you're best at. So for me, you know, I've been responsible for five multi-million dollar businesses. Uh, all before I turned 30. So because of that, it put me in a financial position where I could afford to do something like that. Except I have this ridiculous rule that I will not spend a single dollar on a new business that I didn't earn from that new business outside a small seeding fund that I started at the beginning. Which meant that to get Derek to write this book, I had to pay for it. Sure. But here's what I do know I'm good at. I'm really good at consulting. I'm really good at helping service providers obtain rapid growth within their business. So I could charge for that. I could charge for speaking at events. And because of that, I could totally afford to work with someone like Derek. And because of that, now the process still, when people think, oh, he hired a writer and that means that it's, it's super easy. Well, for the ones that have a book that kind of sucks, that's true. But for the people that really want to have a good book, the process is actually quite intensive. So mm -hmm. you have this full interview process. You then, he then will bring you back this structure that, that looks like, you know, let's call it a well-organized mess and get that, get that back. And it's just about reading it to make sure the flow. Now I had a reading speed of a sixth grader, right? So for me, that means plugging that into a text to voice, uh, as text to voice program and listening to it in a robot voice. Now imagine listening to 30,000 words in a robot voice. How are you feeling about that? Now, then once that's done, you tell them where all the structure is wrong. And of course, you know the IP, right? So of course, there's huge amounts that you've got to add and, and, and move around. So a lot of authors just expect it done for them, but it's in their head, right? And also all of these stories start popping in. So you then start putting all those in. Then you get the, once you've done gone through all that, you're not even close to done. Then you get the first complete chapter. Well, for me, that meant putting that into text to speech again. And for every 3,000 word chapter, I'd write 3,000 words of notes, stories, and comments around it. That would then go back to him. We'd go through the 10 chapters. Then once that was finished, I would then get the book back with the, next, the, the second draft of the, the first chapter. And we'd go through it again. Once that was done, I'd get the whole book. Now I've got another 30,000 words to listen to, text to voice. And I would wow. go through it again. It is a huge process. And you've got to do that many times. So by getting somebody else to do it, what you're really doing is you're hiring somebody that has, for me, I mean, I'm an award-winning blogger, but I'm a very, very passionate writer. And everything I write is like a persuasive document. You can do this. Go out and achieve. The problem with that, no one wants to get yelled at for 30,000 words. <laughs> so true, I, wanted, true. I wanted a book that told stories and made learning fun. Hmm. I think that's the important part about a good book is there should be some type of story underlying it. And... I will agree with you because I have a very diverse library, especially on Audible, and I'm not always in a business mindset mood. Sometimes I'm looking more for something more motivational, inspirational. I'm, I'm like you. I'm passionate that way. I want that that drive, that, that push for the initiative. So if you can get that, 
into a book and then get it across in an audible version. Like I promote all the time. I tell people I have a good amount of physical books, but I tell every single author, you better get this sucker on audible. That way I can buy the second version of it because that's how I'm going to listen to your book more often. I have books I've listened to two, three, five times because when I travel so much, I just speed up the, uh, the listening feature and I can crush a book sometimes twice as fast especially if I'm looking for repeats of specific content that I really enjoy. So a little hack for you, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about audible books, use them. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm a big supporter of audible books myself. I mean, that's how I learned to grow. I mean, when I, I very much, I, I'd read very little books. Like I, my learning for business was predominantly on YouTube. And yeah, I mean, you, you know, your bio, the whole, you know, sixth grade reading level when you got into late high school, that's, but I'll tell you, it makes you feel any better. Uh, there's a, my client right now, he's a successful podcaster, Vinny Twitter, she's called the fitness confidential podcast. He guest stars on Adam Carolla's, which is the Guinness book of world record holder, record holder of podcasts. And so Adam's doing all right, <laughs> but he brought up how he had a learning disability and the, the he, used to, he went to like a Catholic school and they said they used to criticize him because like he'd be the slow reading kid and everybody's already done reading that chapter. They want to move on and Vinny's not done yet. Well then later they found out like his mother was luckily a teacher and she didn't want to give up on trying to figure out the answer. What they found through testing was he was not actually suffering from a disability. It was how he reads. His brain works differently than most children. He was actually literally just memorizing content. He has this crazy photographic memory. Like he can just remember everything. So when you hear him on his podcast, he brings up stuff from like 30, 40 years ago, like it's right there. And I was like, dude, that's crazy. I, you never would have think about that. But unless somebody did that advanced testing, you wouldn't know that, oh, you actually don't have a problem. You're actually probably consuming this content at much more of a depth than most other kids. I don't know if you ever told that or not. <laughs> yeah, so it's funny. There's, there's a quote, although there's a, a picture image I share on social media all the time. And mm. it's based on an Albert Einstein quote of if, you know, if we're all judged, well, I'm trying to remember the way that it's framed, but basically the image is a giraffe, a monkey, a goldfish, and an elephant. And there's a teacher in the front of the room and say, okay, our standardized test says that everybody's gonna be judged on their ability to climb this tree. Hmm. And the quote basically says something like, if we spend our entire life um, being judged based on what our, our non-natural abilities are, we're gonna spend our entire life thinking that we're stupid. And for me, I, I mean, so my, my backstory is, you know, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader. I got diagnosed in late high school. And it's funny, my mother plays a role in this too. Um, so my mother stopped at nothing to find a, a reason for why I couldn't read. And she found that I had what's called scotomic sensitivity syndrome or what's known as Erlen syndrome. Mm. Um, what that basically means is it's not that I can't read. It's that when I look at a white piece of paper, I will see the, you know, in, in white, there is a spectrum of colors. The color yellow is one my brain really struggles with. So when I look at black ink on a white page, the words start to get swallowed by the yellow part of the spectrum in the words. So what that means is when I look at words, when you're younger, you learn to decode different words on the page. When I was younger, the words always looked different because of this visual issue. And because of that, I never learned to decode words, well, letters, then words, then sentences, then paragraphs. So for me, when I turned 16, my mother found these glasses that I put on. They, you know, they, they got me picked on a lot at school because they had this blue lens. Well, the, back then they had a gray lens. Now my new ones have a blue lens. But basically what it means is it filters out the color yellow. And because of that, it's not that I could miraculously learn to, lead, to read, but I could start the reading process. Right, mm -hmm. So I started to learn how to decode the, color, the, the letter, then the word, and then the sentence. But because I don't wear them all the time, I, you know, I, it, I'm not picking up things on the street corners like everybody else does and, and accelerating the process. But it did allow me to, I mean, I worked like hell to get myself. I got to the, I got to the point where I tried, I, I, got, I tried so hard and I got into the top 20% of my state for, um, you know, for, for scores to go to university. And my dad sort of looked at me and he's like, you've tried really hard, but I can tell you're exhausted. And I was, there was no way I wanted to go to university straight away. Um, so I took a year to go and find myself for the year. And okay. I took a job at a real estate agency and I, you know, not 
definitely not the guy selling at the front. I was the guy in the back office with that look on my face saying, don't look at me I'm, or speak to me. I'm here to find myself. I had horrible acne and I just, I was really self-conscious about that as well. So I was just really, really introverted. And my boss comes up to me about three weeks after starting the job. And he's like, Matt, I'm going to have to tell you, I'm really sorry, but uh, the company's decided to close down this office. You're out of a job. I'd worked there three weeks. So it was, it was tough, but I remember like it was around Christmas time and in Australia, we do Christmas and summer break at the same time. So it's, like, okay, so we go on a month's holiday at Christmas. No one's around. You can't get a job. I mean, who's hiring when everyone goes on holidays on the 20th of December? Right. I'm back yeah. on the 15th. It's just crazy. The only jobs I could get was commission-only sales. And as an introverted kid, I mean, you're an introverted kid. Imagine having to do that at 18. Oh, God. If I flash back, there's no way I would have pictured myself becoming a sales professional. Like, Even fast forward to today, yeah, no big deal, but not back then. Even now, I still get chills thinking about it, right? You can see right? like, yeah. on my arm, oh, yeah. I, I literally have goosebumps as we're talking. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, so here's this kid. I've taken this commission on the job because my dad broke his back for 80 hours a week. I wasn't going to tell him, you know, I promised I was supporting myself. We didn't come from a rich family. That's just the way it was going to be. And so I made that decision. I was going to charge in and, and go into, go into to, to this commission on the job. I got five days worth of product training, and then I got thrown onto this road. Uh, it was called Sydney Road, right? It's about a thousand stores on each side. And I go to walk into the first door and I had this realization, no one's told me how to sell. I have no idea what to say. So I take a breath I, and I just walk in and I'm politely told to leave. And then in my next store, I'm sworn at. The store after that, I was told to get a real job. People can be lovely around Christmas. Oh, yeah. Great so, street, by the way. It sounds wonderful. What's that? I said it's a great street. It just sounds wonderful. Oh, it was. And people, when you say you went door to door, people imagine you walking and there's like Versace and Prada. No, it was like these little junk stores, store after store of people struggling to make enough money to survive. Right. And here I am interfering with them, right? It just it wasn't a happy situation. So it was 93 doors before my first sale. So 93 doors of getting rejected and told to get a real job. And I remember I walked out and I made about $70. And I was ecstatic for about 45 seconds until I had this realization, I'm going to do this every day for the rest of the week, every day for the rest of the year. That wasn't okay. Yeah. Now, let's think about this from a, a business owner perspective or a person wanting to date or a life perspective even. Most people, when they have an experience like that, most people ask me the question, why did you go back the next day? And in truth, it was because I promised my father and when I promise something, I, I keep my word. And while my manager had this saying, which is, you know, we just throw mud up against the wall and we see what sticks. And I'm super hoping that I'm the one that sticks, but feels like I'm going to fall off. I show up at work the next day, 18 of the 20 people in my training group didn't stick. But what I did is I went home and I went looking for an answer. And this is why I'm so passionate about audiobooks and YouTube and things like that is because for me, I went looking for an answer. I couldn't exactly pick up a Zig Ziglar or a Brian Tracy book, it would have taken me a year to read those, let alone to apply the information at a reading speed of a sixth grader. What I did find though, is firstly, I convinced myself that sales had to be a system because if it wasn't, I was kind of screwed for the year. My life was going to suck. So I convinced myself that it was going to be a system. And then I went looking for that system and I stumbled across some videos by a plethora of different authors around sales and the different steps in selling. So I focused on a different step every day. And every day I went out and I spent eight hours practicing in the field, getting rejected a lot of the time, and then eight hours going home, practicing the steps, role playing, you know, saying things into the mirror, saying things in my head. It was a horrible six weeks. But the number of doors that it took me to close was like 93 down to 72, down to 48, down to 21, down you were to optimizing. You were three. Learning. Every day it got better, right? I learned how to qualify to speak to the decision maker, how to close better, all the things that, you know, that are in the book. But basically what I discovered is that, well, well I discovered that it was a system and, and I proved it because I was delivering repeatable results. But then, you know, about six weeks into my career, my manager calls me in and says, Matt, I, I gotta tell you, we're, we're kind of blown away. We just got our monthly sales reports and you're sitting as the number one sales performer in the company. And the company just happened to be the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. It took six weeks. 
Huh. Now, this is the really important thing for people to know. I went from the skier that broke his shoulder on the first, uh, the first ski trip to being the number one skier on, um, in the company for a period, you know, in a period of six weeks or in sales, the number one sales performer. The reason why this is so important for people to know is because we set up these barriers and we say we can't do these things. But through education, this is why YouTube was so important to me and back then, and now Audible is so important to me. When I moved to the United States, while I've been responsible for five multi-million dollar success stories, you know, they were all bricks and mortar retail stores, tally marketing stores, that sort of thing. When I moved to the United States, I decided that I wanted to have that flexibility. I mean, if I want to go back to Australia for any reason, I want to be able to go. I don't want to go, oh, but I've got that store there. I've got all these staff. I have to worry about it. Plus, you know, every business that I had had grown from nothing to like 50 staff in the space of three years. I just wanted to have this little boutique coaching business that turned out to not be so boutique, but I still have the fact that I'm allowed to, I pick up my laptop and I can be anywhere in the world and do an interview like this. And that's what I wanted. And the problem was I didn't know how to even change the word the to the word they on the website. No clue. So I decided I wanted to be that person that if I'm going to have an internet business, I need to understand it back to front, right? Or oh as Americans say, front to back. So Australians do, just like the toilet's been the wrong way, we do front to back, back to front. We get confused. <laughs> but It's like me with my marathon training, completely backwards. It's okay. Exactly right. <laughs> and so for me, though, what I did is I started listening to Audible books on online strategy, online systems. I started consuming blog posts on you know, online strategy and online systems. It took me roughly three months to put together my strategies. Now I'm talking, Australians speak quickly, we listen quickly too. I'm a three times speed audible guy, right? I'll listen to blog posts on two times speed because gosh, that the blog post reader sounds terrible. Um, but, and also you're covering- My, my fiance calls it chipmunk mode. And every time, she, every time she gets in the car, she's like, could you please switch that back? She's like, I can't stand it. <laughs> Doesn't it feel like everyone speaks in slow motion though when you switch it back? It does, but again, we're you don't start out that way, but eventually you hear about it on somebody else's podcast. Like, oh, I do 1.5, I do 2.0. I'm like, well, let me try it. And now I can't stop. Like I, my, my own client, Vinny Tortorchev, he's now my client. I'm actually helping him with a crowdfunding Indiegogo campaign right now. So I'm doing the marketing management for that. And <laughs> it's like, I forget when I talk to him on the phone, it's not how I hear him on his podcast show because <laughs> I'm used to him two and a half times. And I'm like, man, you sound really slow today, Vinny. And I'm like, oh, that's just how he normally talks. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, but that's how I started. I mean, I started by listening to podcasts myself, right? So I remember I listened to, I'm going to say safely three, maybe 400 podcast episodes from, um, some, some, from a variety of different people. But that gave me a reading list. So then I read so many books. I mean, I would get to just, I was at home. I mean, there was three months that my now fiance girlfriend back then, really, she was like, this guy just sits on the couch all day. Like, how is he responsible for so many business success? She, she doesn't know what you're doing. <laughs> She's like, what are you doing? And literally all I did like is that I would, I would research the right blog post to read and me and my dog would go on really long walks. And by, you know, I, I would go for an, you know, a, a two hour walk, but I listened to a book on three times speed. I could go through a book and a half in yeah. that walk. So for me, within the space of three months, I completely created my own strategy for how I was going to grow my online business. I mean, it was seven months. I was an award-winning blogger and listed by Evan Carmichael as one of the most retweeted business coaches on Twitter. And, you know, it's, it's, I'm now ashamed to say, and I will say this highly, I am now ashamed to say that I used to make fun of internet marketers and say, they're just too scared to pick up the phone like I was when I was 18. <laughs> the, the truth is, the strategies absolutely work. Now, here's the thing. A lot of internet marketers are too scared to pick up the phone. And a lot of offline marketers are too scared to learn online marketing. But when you load both skills, my gosh, you can have an explosive business. Oh, God, the cross-pollination is powerful. Um, and since you were talking about the whole award-winning stuff, I mean, again, for our video watchers, ladies and gentlemen, again, listeners, like go check out MatthewPollard.com because he's got a whole media section. So just like he was saying how you want to hear and maybe get some cross-pollination from other shows, maybe, I mean, I know, Live the Fuel is awesome. I know we appreciate your subscriptions. You're, you guys are great. But like, dude, he's been featured on Inc., Forbes, Fortune, Entrepreneur, Fox, 
get response, EO fire, you know, you name it. But then you scroll down, he's got a whole catalog of all these different podcasts and, you know, Fox TV. So he, here's the power of what he's just talking about. It could be an audio book. It could be a podcast. It doesn't matter. But you might listen to this show and then hear about another show and another book. And he's already kind of this name chopped on here. By the way, real quick, you'll appreciate this, Matt. Here is your quote from Albert Einstein. So, oh, good man. Thank you for that. Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. So now <laughs> with evidence that I absolutely butchered that quote, but I'm so it's, glad because it's such an... But here's the thing. You remembered it and it gave me something to search for. And I wanted to make sure we didn't forget to share this because um, every time I release a blog article for these podcasts, I, I asked him, you probably already have a quote mentioned in, in, in your onboarding form. I always ask for that. Your assistant probably helped put that in there. But then if any other pop quotes come out, it's just it's valuable content. People need – someone, one person might have been inspired by that one quote, either your version of it or the original version of it today. So uh, you got to share. That's the whole point. So, But listen, we're coming to the end of our, our time slot today. And I'm glad we're actually closing a little bit on the, on, the, on the power of quotes because I'm a big fan and I'm a big supporter. And literally, when I started Live the Fuel, my first Facebook page uh, posts were all quotes. That's, I, I was all about mindset. I wanted to motivate. I wanted to inspire. And the first six months to a year of my content was mostly that, was just getting that type of common energy out there and attracting the right people that actually respected that. So, um, but so listen... All of my co-hosts, they close the show, not me. All right. I mean, I'll do my little closing thing, but I think you guys are the guest co-hosts. So is there any kind of all-encompassing message behind everything you're doing right now? Obviously, the book launch is huge. Ladies and gentlemen, please download it or get it. I mean, again, I'm an Audible fan, but hey, maybe you want the physical. Go for it. I've had, I have books where I buy both versions. <laughs> so um, but it, summing it up, man, is there anything all-encompassing right now you want to leave behind for our audience? Yeah, I think, I think it's really important for people to understand that, well, two things. One is really focusing on what they do want. So many people spend their entire lives focusing on what other people have told them to want. And I think we've, we've spent a great deal of time talking about making sure that you really understand to go after what you do really want in life and determining what that is, but then stopping at nothing to achieve that. I mean, the reason I wrote the book, The Introvert's Edge, is to make sure people understand that sales is not a limitation for introverts to succeed in sales careers, in their business careers, or in their own, in their own businesses. But that was a huge milestone for a lot of people because they believe that that was a limitation for themselves. In truth, there are no limitations for you to succeed in your business. There are no limitations for you to succeed in your own career, except for what's happening up here. So work on that. Love that. Well, listen, I ain't telling you to probably go buy it off the air. Ladies and gentlemen, we've dropped quotes. We've dropped backstories. You've heard about his childhood. You've heard about his successful businesses. I mean, he's got a lot to share. So as we already hinted, get the book, visit the website, start taking action, work on your personal development, your professional development. The whole point here is keep moving forward. So again, thanks for tuning in to another Live the Fuel show. And again, remember, we fuel your health, your business, your lifestyle, and you too can live the fuel. We'll talk to you guys again soon. You're free of the pod. I just leave a video on for extra fun. So <laughs> That was good fun, bud. Thanks for making it different. I, I, I usually get really good feedback from people who come on the show. Like, that was so different. I really enjoyed that. I got to be myself. And I was like, okay, then I'm going to keep doing it that way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so, I, I think it's important because these days people just go from listening to the same type of podcast to the same type of podcast. And I can imagine people will listen to yours and come back to it because it doesn't sound the same. Well, and what I, I am getting more feedback on is that people are like, oh, I had to go back and listen to that because they heard it a little bit differently the next time, right? Not all the little nuggets of knowledge were recognized before, but then they can go back now. It's not categorized. It's not, here's the chunk where we talk about inspiration. Here's the chunk where we talk about strategy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, it's yeah. really good, man. Well, good. Really good. Yeah, I love it. And I'm, uh, I'll have to subscribe to your show because I haven't actually listened to that yet. So I apologize. I definitely check out the book, obviously. I got on. How is it you haven't read all of my website? And my I internet? know, really? Yeah, here's the problem. That people keep shipping me books. <laughs> it's like, 
I, I need to have like another whole person just mind dumping all the content into my head. Uh, so you know what yeah. gets you know what gets me? I constantly tell people on all my podcast interviews that I can't read books. And people will send me a book and say, I heard you on this podcast. I was hoping you're up for endorsing my book. And I'm like, or they'll ask me to endorse the book or they'll ask me if they can be on my show or they'll say, can I speak at small business festival or something like that. And I'm like, oh, they go, they go right for the clothes. And I'm like, yeah, but they've gone, not only have they gone right with the clothes, they've shipped me something that in the podcast, if they had to listen to it, they would have realized I can't read. No. And I'm like, just think about it, right? Uh, so, hey, do you, do you guys have an audio version of it? Yeah. There we go. You can share them on Audible. I would love to see one. I would get through that in an hour. You just you just reinforced why I highly recommend Audible. Also, just because of your childhood. It's like, guys, that's why Like, if you're an author, you got to go both. If you're not doing both these days, you're missing a huge audience. So, so, I have a, so my book has, as I said, it's moved like four, four and a half thousand copies now but it is being blown out of the water by Audible. Like, I mean, blown out of the water by Audible. Like Audible's yeah. moved so many copies. It's like, it's in the, like the top, well, anywhere between 700 to a couple of thousand in the bestseller rankings all the time. Really? Yeah, where the, like the, the my paperback sits between like, well, it, it has got up higher, but now it's like between 25 and 35, which, okay. It's outstanding for a book that's gone past launch mode. But the audio books, the thing that's, because people are like, oh, I'll just out, you know, it sounds good. They'll just listen to something because they're in the car. They would treat it like a podcast and they've got their one token subscription every month that they have to spend. Yeah. So the sales audience goes, oh, that's something different. Well, here's the best part. My fiance and I now share the Audible. So then she takes all the credits. So I'm always having to buy my books anyway. So now it's kind of like opened up how much I consume because I don't wait for the credit. I just buy two or three books at a pop. So, yeah, I, I never managed <laughs> the one credit thing. I'm always waiting for those special deals to come up where there's like three credits or 10 credits. Well, I should say my fiance waits for those and she just buys them because she sees my audible bill yeah. every month. And she's like, you're always talking about profit, Matthew. You've got to stop spending all this money on books. Hey, that is worthwhile overhead. That's what I tell her. I'm like, come on. I was like, this is a reinvestment in myself. And you, you're, she's a traveling uh, equ or horse there. She's an equine vet. So she's in her vehicle all the time. She's crushing. I turned her on the audible. So because she wanted something to do in the car, when she's driving from, you know, horse race farm to horse race farm. Like, well, there you go, baby. Now you have all the ability to get your content in. So, well, uh, my, it's funny. So my, my coaching fee has gone up significantly, like maybe three times. Uh, it's doubled three times in the space of about two and a half years. And I keep saying a lot of that's to do with Audible. So therefore, my, my bill totally makes sense. But what I also can tell you is I wrote an article about Audible in salesforce.com and in yeah. And where it really paid itself off is they put me on the front page of their website for two weeks and emailed their entire business database about my what, book. In Salesforce? No, no. Oh. Audible put me on the front page of their website for two weeks. Oh, God, that's huge. Well, yeah. also, again, just to... The keyword introvert, huge market. So just, you got, you nailed it with the branding and your messaging and obviously something you care a lot about. It's huge, it's huge. Like I literally am gonna add this book because I'm building a library on my website of recommended books. I'm putting you in there because there's people I coach that are always talking about how can I get to where you're at? I'm more introverted. Get that book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you, my, we talk about sh breaking your shoulder. My lip, my fir the first literary agent I spoke to yelled at me for 10 minutes about how the, the ridiculousness of the concept. And I'm like, yeah, it's all right. I can, I can deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why, don't, we, why don't we put it out there? Let's see what the, uh, the, the, the people think. So. Yeah. I'm going to wait until it hits 10,000 copies. I'm waiting for my stats to come in in October. I think I'll be there by then in August. Nice. Um, and I'm, I'm going to send her a, a bow around the book with the, the sales stats. No, I'm not that. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> that would that would be great, actually. I would love that. I, I think that's a smart idea. Uh, <laughs> FYI, by the way, I love how the fact you've got, um, and I do have to get on another call here, but the your podcast. Um, I've actually had Brian Smith on as well. So I love the fact you got Brian on there. Felt another fellow. I told you I've had a lot of Aussies on my show. So. Uh, Mate, Brian, Brian's terrific. He just spoke at Inc. 5000. 
Oh. Um, he did, yeah, he had well, and I had him on a year ago, and he said he's trying to get into more speaking engagements and grow his professional speaking career. I'm like, you've got a story to share. I think he definitely got a lot more to go. So he spoke at Small Business Festival and he was sensational. So he, um, yeah, he's he's a great speaker. Uh, he's just an all round great guy. So no, I'm a big fan of Brian. He endorsed. He he did this amazing endorsement for my book as well, um, a video endorsement. So which was oh, awesome. perfect. Yeah. 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 So cool, well, man. But if I if I could give back to you, please don't hesitate. To, it's all about cross pollination. If I can help you, I mean, obviously you're doing quite well. So I don't know if I can help you at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate it, man. I mean, for me, it's all about just having quality people like you in my network. And, you know, I, I really, I really appreciate the stuff that you're doing. And uh, it, it sounds like you would still consider yourself an introvert. Is that a fair statement? Oh, no. Well, I mean, that way you just redefine it today. I guess there is still a piece of me as an introvert, but well, where I do you mean, get your energy? where do you get your energy from? My athletics. But, but I'm, just, I'm like, it's like, my, and also just, well, there's, there's two pieces of that. It's the passion. Like I'm just, you talk about fiance. She's like, you have too much energy. You're kind of annoying sometimes. <laughs> uh, so, but I, I, I'm a, I, again, my brand is about life balance. That's why I, I'm a CFL one CrossFit coach. I was a USA ski race coach. I used to teach spinning. I go out on hundred mile, you know, cherry cycling events, road cycling. Like when I'm not doing business, I'm doing a lot of health and fitness. It all fuels it because that's my brand. It's like, that's why I talk about health, business, and lifestyle. And so a lot of my passion, my energy comes from the fact that I am uh, a huge health nut. I'm always t teaching people about health and fitness and their nutrition and their lifestyle and sleep cycles and everything else. It all comes out in the podcast now too. So it, it's all tied together. But in the end, and maybe it's from me channeling that childhood. Like I didn't have a lot going on back then. I grew up on a farm. Okay, I was a farm kid. Like my first job was milking cows at a big dairy farm down the road. Never expected to be running an Indiegogo marketing campaign for a guy who has a way bigger following than I do. But uh, you know, a lot of things change over the years. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh, the reason I ask is, you know, if if you do like, if you think about it though, like, because there was a t for about ten years, I trained a lot and. But for me, it was the, even though I could have done group sessions, it was the doing the training by myself or with one person that charged me up. If I was doing things with a group, it didn't. But um, the reason I ask is have a think about it. And it, I'm just trying to figure out a way. I only bring introverts onto my show as all. Um, so oh, yeah. if you think about it and have a think about where you get your energy from, and if it's with people, I can't, I can't bring you on. But if it's from bringing your, you're just being, by yourself or training by yourself. I mean, I know that you're super passionate. Oh, I actually do. Okay, so that's interesting. I never thought about that way. Yes, I've always been a solo artist. Like I've coached teams in the business world and I was a team coach, but like I just competed in a CrossFit competition on a six person team two weeks ago in Philadelphia. My fiance was on one of the other teams. I was on the other team, but that was weird for me. Like I don't, it's usually me and my workouts and that's it. Like I love to go out on a road biking ride by myself. I'll go out with one or two friends once in a while, but I don't have, I don't like to wait for people. I just, I take action and go. I, I'm fine in my own mind. <laughs> this is the thing that I'm getting at. So for you, if, for instance, I can coach groups. I can, and I do enjoy it. I do enjoy speaking in front of groups as well. Right. Which is your, I train this, I train this, I train this. But yeah. that's where I draw, draw my energy. After that, I need some downtime, right? Oh, yeah. That, I, I'm, I'm vibe with you on that. I need to decompress. It's, it's weird. I, so, um, well, that's introversion, dude. That's not weird. Uh, that's just your nature, right? Uh, so that's, that's what I'm sort of getting at. So for everybody, like, and this is what I mean about the, the knowledge of around introverts is so now clouded because everybody thinks they've got to be an A-type personality. The fact that you're passionate and excited about this stuff and therefore want to talk to lots of people about it that doesn't mean you're not introverted. It just uh, means you're passionate and excitable about that content. But I'm passionate and excitable about a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. The thing is that when I get the opportunity to relax, right? Now that could be, you know, there are some times, like for instance, after this podcast interview, I have, and I'm checking the time, I have about 30 minutes. So I'm gonna go for a run, right? Yep. So I'm going to go for a 15 minute run, then I'm going to have a shower and I'm going to get back and do the, the next thing of a sales call that I've got coming up, right? After, an, after the sales call that I've got, I'm having lunch, I'll be watching TV, and I'll be chilling out because those are my ways of re-energizing myself. And while it seems lazy, it's to make myself as most as productive as possible. But I will share you one more thing and maybe this will reinforce who I am. 
So I took, to, I left the corporate world in 09 and then part of my brand and the fire and the logo is because I got to go out West. I made myself, I, I just, I need, I needed a break. So I went and got certified with the federal government. And then I got a job as one of the elite hotshot wild and firefighters on a hotshot firefighting crew. And there you can't be an individual per speed. You're just a monkey in the lineup and be a good soldier, so to speak, and fight that fire. The point is though, is that from that, when I had my days off, I would go to the movie theater by myself. I still do that to this day. And my fiance says, I'm weird. She's like, nobody goes to the movie theaters by themselves. I was like, I love it. I just go on Fandango. I find a movie that I want to go see. I go there by myself and I relax. I have two to three hours of just decompression. And it is a huge life hack that I highly recommend for a lot of people. I don't care how weird it looks. So what's funny is that works really well for introverts. Okay. For extroverts. So it's, it's just funny. Like I, I, I'll, I'll speak to a bunch of people. It's like Ivan Meisner, the funny story I was telling you about is yeah. Ivan Meisner spoke to his wife and he's talking about as an extrovert, like him, he has these characteristics and she's like, you're an introvert. And he's like, no, 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 I'm the largest network. I created the largest networking group in the world. How could I possibly? She's like, you're an introvert. Eventually he got frustrated, did the test and discovered he was an introvert. Mm. The fact that you can do all these things and you're passionate about these things and you're happy to be out and about doesn't mean, I mean, that sign of, I just need three hours. Like there are some times that I know I've spoken at a bunch of events. I've been in and around and I'm just, I need to disappear for a day. And I do, I just disappear. I tell, I, I tell Brittany that I'm, I'm disappearing for a day and I just disappear and I go and do my own thing. Yeah. And, you know, I might just be sitting at a park, staring at a tree. I might be working, doing, you know, emails on my laptop. I might be, you know, sitting in one of the rooms watching TV with all the lights off, just, you know. Oh, I was, last night, at the end of Mother's Day, I, I grilled and cooked dinner for my future mother-in-law and her father was over here. And, and then they left. I was like, all right, baby, close this door, came in here, and I just did my own thing for the next like two hours until it was time to go to sleep. I have my boot locker glasses on, everything else. But uh, I, yeah, I, I go to Starbucks, put my headphones in, I went there working alone. I don't, I'm, I'm fine. Like, I love the independence. I'm, I'm a very big advocate for independence. Just, and I got news for you, dude. You're an introvert. Okay. Well, there we go. <laughs> I just didn't, I guess I was not explaining the definition properly all these years. And the funny thing is I minored in psychology. How do I not know this? Well, <laughs> my sister was a psychologist and I never listened to her either. So I'm assuming you just didn't listen to your professors, but that's fine. <laughs> I listened enough to get some A's to jump, you know, to jump the GPA back up there. But, uh, this was what I, this, yeah. <laughs> University, we listen to past tests, but no, that's yeah. cool. Dude. Well, it sounds like that's a fit. So if you email Shannon, just to let her know, um, oh. we chat, She'll be able to. Um, she'll get you on my list. Like we've got a back. You know, we've got a, a long waiting list of guests. But um, I will um, add you to it, and then when the time comes, we'll get you on the show. Does she monitor the Matthew at email? No, just send it to Shannon at rapidgrowthcoach.com. Oh, okay. She would have communicated with you in the past, wouldn't she? I'm guessing, but obviously, I'm looking at what ended up into my Trello project management system. So send, I have. I'm yeah. going to send you the email address on chat now. Oh, perfect. Yeah, just in case, because I, I go off of what was submitted through the online uh, co-host form, and yeah. yeah, there we go. Cool. I can so use it. unless yeah, unless you email that and say and and say that we're on the podcast together, like a lot of people will request to be on my show, so just <laughs> let know that we've spoken. And hey, I tell people all the time. I, I I spoke for the first time at a podcast conference last year, and I said, guys, I know not everybody's doing it yet because some of us are introverts, but it's like, you need to start cross pollinating and helping each other's shows grow. Um, so that's why I was like, I was offering, if you want to be on this, great. I don't have to be on, but I was like, if it, if it fits great, I'm happy to support. And if anything, I think it's important people to start learning that this is how you start getting yourself out there. Like get out of your comfort zone, get on a microphone and go on somebody's podcast. And most podcasts aren't like mine. You don't have to worry about the video. I'm putting video out there. <laughs> most of them are all still audio. So, uh, it should make some people set at ease. I do. I do both on mine. Um, so if somebody's got like, so I do, I do them in batches. So I'll do like eight back to back interviews in a day. So yep. I'll do a little studio and I'll do a full studio day. Um, but then the audio days, but then if somebody's got one that's rushed, I'll do an audio podcast to put it in. And that's why right. it's like when we do studio days, I did six, uh, 16, 24 back to back interviews, uh, last time, um, for my podcast. 
Nice. So, well, uh, are you are you still using Skype and not using Zoom yet? No, we're using Zoom. We're using Zoom. So my first... I'm 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 going to be forcing Vinny out of his comfort zone. He's 55. I'm like Vinny. You you just told me you need to grow your YouTube presence, and your show after six years is still 100 percent audio. And you and you on your half of your shows you complain about Skype's connectivity and performance all the time. I've been listening to you for four years. Time to change. <laughs> the thing is that, so I'm not sure how much you've seen my social profile, but I grab the little segments from the podcast. I put the 45 second clips on social media. Yeah. Some get as much as 12,000 views. Are you, are you using Lumen for that? Or uh, there's a couple different apps that do that now, but I use, I use CoSchedule. Okay. Yeah. But I've been, I've been needing to do that because it's just, again, one more thing to add to the thing, but it's like, I already have all the content. I just got to get that snippet out and you are right. They're, they're getting, Great response times. So, yeah, I mean, the social YouTube's not craving video, but social media absolutely is. So, oh, yeah, get it on yeah. there. But, mate, Pardon. I actually was supposed to be on a call three minutes ago, so I've got to jump. But I agree. Uh, again, it was great hanging, and I will be updating you guys once the show is coming out. So, yeah, I'm usually about two weeks out. So, perfect, man. Uh, hit me up on social media with all of the links, and I'll, I'll share them with my audience as well. Oh, yeah, I always send out a nice little email, it has everything in there. Awesome. Easy, man. All right, take care. Bye.